Good evening. On behalf of the India Foundation for the Arts Archive, supported by and in association with the Indorama Charitable Trust, we welcome you to the very first date with the archive. As some of you know, India Foundation for the Arts is a body that supports and implements projects in arts and culture across the country. We've been doing that for the last 25 years, having so far supported and implemented over 700 projects across the arts, across various practices, regions, languages, disciplines. The outcomes of these projects are out there in the public domain as books, films, workshops, archival material, websites, productions, performances, you name it. We believe that the work that we make possible the incredible work that our scholars and artists do need to be out there and accessed as much as possible. Keeping this in mind, when we turned 20, we decided to create our own archive where all this material will be housed, both online, digitally, as well as in the physical site. We got support from the Indorama Charitable Trust from day one, and they have helped us build this archive, which is even now in the process of being created, but we have over 350 projects from over the years on our online and offsite um, physical archive that we have. Now, one of the things that we decided to do was not only engage people in the work that is in the archive at IFA and welcome all of you to come access the archive, take a look at what it is, but also build a discourse around how archives are used, managed, what are the dilemmas around archives, what are the ethical issues. And a very important fact of that is that how can artists use archives? We all know that scholars use archives, their books have mentions of archives, even the imagination, the visual that we get when we think of an archive is that researchers and scholars are sitting there for hours and using the work. But can archives also be resources for artists, performing artists, visual artists, poets, filmmakers, dancers? And how do these artists make use of the material that they find in these archives? That is the discussion that we thought we would do with a series of conversations that we call Date with the Archive. And we are so happy that the very first Date with the Archive is happening today and all of you have been able to join us just a couple of house rules. As you know, most of you have been on webinars many times. There is a chat box where you can put up your comments, your uh, suggestions, your um, anything that you want to say about the talk that you will just witness. But there is also a Q&A box. And at the end of the talk today, we are going to take Q&A questions and you can put your questions in that box. Now, many of you may be just watching us over Facebook and are not registered and part of the Zoom conversation. But on Facebook, on the IFA page where you're watching this live stream, you can put up your questions there and somebody from IFA will inform us what they are and we will have them um, answered by our guest speaker today. And uh, so that are the house rules. And now I would like to hand this over to my colleague, the archivist at IFA, Bishadi who will give you a little introduction about um, our invited speaker, uh, the guest who will be inaugurating this date with the archive today. Vishwadeep, over to you. Thank you, Arundhati, uh, and good evening, everyone. Uh, for our first talk of the series, Date with the Archive, this evening, we have with us Navte Singh Johar, who is a renowned dancer and choreographer, scholar, yoga exponent, and urban activist. Recipient of the Sangeet Natak Academy Award for Contemporary Choreography in 2014, his work within all fields of his varied interests remains consistently body-centric. It merges practice with critical theory and social action, traverses freely between the traditional and the contemporary, and rigorously engages both the philosophical and the sociological discourses of the body. In his presentation this evening, Navtej will feature four of his works that talk about constructed nationalistic notions that classify art into high and low, the attractions and revulsions that abounds in unequal power relations between the master and the servant, and the appropriation of narratives of freedom. After his presentation, 
Orundhati and I will take audience questions. So now without further ado, I'd request Navtej Singh Jawar to please take the stage. Hello, thank you, Bishwadeep. Thank you, Arundhati. Thank you, IFA, <clears throat> for having invited me to be the, the first speaker for Date to the Dark and uh, the archive. Um, when I just, I must say that when um, I was first informed that I was being considered to come and speak today, I kind of bought, I said, I told Arundhati, uh, I'm not the person because I, I'm, uh, I'm an artist, I'm not a scholar. Uh, at least um, uh, that's, I, that's the, uh, uh, the position that I was being uh, called out as, as an artist. And, uh, and then we started speaking and then um, I realized that I do uh, rely on, uh, so to speak, archival material because we can, we, can, we can today, as we go along, even redefine what archive is. In fact, that's the whole idea. I think the whole idea of the talk today is because IFA is an is a art archive. I think I'd like to really open up this um, conversation to talk about the possibility and the impossibility of an archive and also uh, uh, the possibility of a creative component uh, in an archive and um, IFA being an arts archive, how uh, creativity can also perhaps um, uh, bridge the lacune or the what we can call the impossibility of the archive through creative means. So before I um, talk about my work, I uh, feel that I, I mean, I, uh, I would like to um, kind of uh, open, um, open up the, the whole idea of an archive, the way I understand it. And um, because it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a easy uh, concept. It's not a, uh, it's, 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 it can be a problematic concept. Um, and I think it's very, very important. And I'm sure all of us already are cognizant of the problems of an archive. Um, or the limitations of an archive. And uh, so I'm just going to uh, go through like my notes for a couple of, a few minutes um, before I start talking about my work, which will be impromptu then. So I just checked up the dictionary meaning of an archive and it says it's a collection of historical documents or records providing information about a place, institution, or a group of people. So it is, um, it is records um, and it is written down, it's recorded. So of course, uh, uh, this itself can bring up questions like who, who is doing the records, uh, who is commissioning the recording, um, all that stuff, which we are not going to get into. Uh, but the, the um, talking of the IFA and its position today, like they, like Arundhati said, that you know it's like twenty years on that they have, they have decided to. Um, open an archive, it kind of signifies it's a, it's a big milestone. So it's a milestone which is which we are celebrating today, actually, celebrating and uh, congratulating uh, IFA for. It's a celebration, it's a, it's a rite of passage for, for IFA. And uh, when I say rite of passage, it's going from one, um, it's, it's shifting positions or it's, or it's adding yet another position um, to its already existing framework. So what we can um, assume is when archive, when IFA decides to open an archive, that IFA has been, or the Indian India Foundation of the Arts has existed for a significant amount of time. Therefore, it has a history. So that's that's number one. Um, and the activities of the IFA so far have been have not been random, but they have been planned, organized, and even so to speak projected. Um, um, so these are assumptions um, that the project activities of IFA have been documented and categorized. Um, so far, so they already have had a system of organization and documenting and indexing, which eventually facilitated the archive. So uh, that, that's also a presumption um, that it does, uh, it considers uh, its activities as important uh, so that um, um, uh, it feels that these activities uh, and these findings uh, will uh, have a bearing upon the future of the arts in the country. So it is time for it to kind of uh, so it's it's kind of feeling ready to kind of leave a legacy behind. So it's a kind of coming of age, literally. It's, that's why I'm calling it right of passage. It's coming of age because now um, they are not just growing, but now they are uh, they they're rec it's a self recognition that they can actually leave behind a legacy, and that's what they're getting ready for. 
and also that there's a there's some kind of a cohesion that operates within the foundation that that both sustains and further builds upon its this organization um, and so on. Um, so in a way, this signifies that our IFA has arrived. <clears throat> in some way, it has arrived. Uh, it has matured. But on the other hand, uh, it's also making a very nascent entry into the world of archive, which is a totally different ball game. If, if people would know, so it's 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 a it's a it's a very um, um, yeah it's it's a very nascent period, whereas the archive is concerned. So um, so and that's why I want to talk about the archive. Um, so as the as the as this invitation of being the first speaker, um, I feel that it's my um, it's my uh, it's an opportunity for me to be able to um, talk about the promises um, that the archive holds and also the promises that the archive betrays um, and also about the possibility and the impossibility of the archive that I earlier spoke about. Um, so we know what the possibility of the archive is, but I think it's also kind of important to, um, to uh, uh, register what the impossibilities might be and how we can um, counter them. So a primary understanding of the archive is that it's uh, like that it's, it's somewhere that historians go, you know, um, that it's got to do with documents and maps and lectures and interviews and photographs and um, um, news clips and whatever else, a paraphernalia, um, through which they kind of reconstruct historical facts, so to speak. So it's like a bank. It's a bank of information. And uh, this information, of course, is multi-layered, as I said. And uh, so it's it's uh, uh, so the archive in a way is helping uh, reconstruct or helping uh, it's throwing back some information. Um, uh, like I would say that how like I was when other people speaking I was wondering how would this archive help artists tomorrow? What what would I personally like to include in the archive so that it might help? And one of the things that came up to my mind was that you know it is. Um, it is processes that uh, because uh, uh, it is uh, yeah it is processes and 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 the voice and the first person voice of the artist as to how the artist is dealing with the uh, with whatever he or she is dealing with um, I think these voices are very important because what the newcomer into the field is looking for is not just ways and methods but he or she is also looking for some endorsement um, and I think voices can lend that endorsement, uh, especially when it deals with the arts, which which deals with the abstract or something ambiguous or uh, uh, ambivalent. So I think these voices um, of how one generation deals with the, the same very things uh, that art requires uh, would, I feel, uh, be interesting. Um, so we also know that this is kind of, you know, a building up of like historical truths based on uh, 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 reconstructing of history, uh, but also based on truths. But what is interesting or what is problematic is that these truths are stated truths. The archived truths, whatever they mean, are, are stated truths. So what about those truths that are unstatable, that cannot be stated? Not that they're, of course, there are truths that are not allowed to be stated. That's a different story. Or, or truths that are censored, or it's like one person's truth against another. I'm not talking of those kind of truths. I'm also talking of the truths that cannot be stated, which are beyond articulation. And as a, as a dancer, I deal with that truth, which only my body can murmur and betray, but I can't find a word. My word will always be kind of gross um, in comparison to just the flicker of my eye. Um, so what about those truths? Because especially if it's an art archive, we are dealing with this. This is the stuff of an artist, uh, not the stated truths, but what lies between the lines, um, so to speak. Um, and if it is, so the other thing is, this is one. And the other thing is that if, if we are talking of truths, so the, uh, what about the, uh, how honest, so what about the honesty of the truths? And more than the honesty of the truths, what about the emotion, emotional honesty? When I say emotional honesty, I mean what goes behind the truth, the motivation that goes behind the truth, um, the undisclosed motivations, the hidden agendas, the ambitions, 
Um, all that is kind of kept behind the scenes, in the wings. Um, where do all these bits of information go and how, how can we create a system in which we can also elicit these um, bits of information which are um, ostensibly unavailable because they are the ones that actually form the entire picture and then connect it to a context. Because we are also, when we're looking at, at an archive, we're also looking at, a, at recreating a context of, of placing an art or an activity or an event within a historical, political, socio-cultural context. Um, so uh, what is happening, what is, the, what is the talk happening, so to speak? What is the popular narrative at that point? To connect it, I think it's important to kind of also find a way to include the undisclosed um, information and also find a ways of finding, if, of including the un, unspeakable, um, uh, that is something beyond, beyond articulation. Um, let me just go to my... So what we um, um, come across is, or is the, the first problem of the archive, because archive, I would say, somewhere falls within uh, the realm of, um, of course, within history, but, and I would place history within the realm of human sciences, which are imperfect. So um, history is recording events um, of humans, of human activities, but the human is at a very fundamental level ambivalent. So what about this, if we, if we are talking about ambivalence, uh, there is hardly any room for ambivalence in the archive, as far as I can see, because ambivalence is unstatable, unrecordable. Um, and it's, it's uh, within, within the idea of order, and archive is of course maintaining an order, within order, ambivalence is um, dismissed, uh, if not scoffed upon. So, um, so I, 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 and as an artist, ambivalence is my stuff. So I really, um, it's very exciting that I think can perhaps find a way of including, of creating an, an archive of ambivalence because that is the stuff of art, um, the, ab the abstract, the ambivalent, that, that lurks between the lines, um, the unstated, the undisclosed. Uh, so, uh, to my mind, this uh, this kind of uh, 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 this is the additional um, challenge, but also a very exciting promise um, that um, or an opportunity for IFA um, to create an archive of the arts for the arts by the arts, um, and using creative means um, which are sensitive to which are able to, um, if not. Um, state ambivalence, of course, it can't be. But if 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 the if the if the documentation itself is designed in such a manner that it can it can suggest ambivalence, um, I think that would be. Uh, so I'm seeing the IFA archive as a piece of art. Actually, that's that's what I'm beginning to kind of imagine, um, which, to my mind, is the um, is the beauty of an art archive, or the possibility of an art archive, because that's our that's our capital. Um, art is our capital and ambivalence is the capital of art. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is what I'd like to speak of the archive. I don't want to go any further. Let me just jump to my own work now. And um, my own work, so when Arundhati asked me to talk about um, my work and I, and I balked and I said, but my work is not archival. And then I looked back and um, as I said, Almost all my work over the last two decades um, very, is, is very uh, soundly placed on something historic. Um, and when I say historic, I, I, I even include poetry. I even include um, songs, images, um, gestures, um, which, which, have, which have a lived history, so to speak. Um, so uh, so I, that's what that's what kind of uh, warmed me up to the idea of saying yes to Parandati to accept this invitation. And so uh, preparing for this talk, I started thinking about, I started reviewing, I started re revisiting my work of the last um, two decades. And the one thing that comes across as a common theme in almost all of them is that almost all my works um, juxtapose narratives. I don't think I've ever made a piece in the last 20 or 25 years, which is only about one thing. It's always about two things put together, 
not two things bleeding into each other, but two things rubbing shoulders with each other and just put together. So this is the juxtaposition. So these are two narratives. And of course, the two narratives are complementary. They're not like totally off, um, uh, un unrelated. They are related, but they are coming from different uh, contexts, to see, so to speak, from different historical contexts, cultural contexts, um, uh, temporal contexts. And, and then to see, and then, then, then um, so this, is a, this has been my lure, so to speak, to put chalk and cheese together, literally. I'll, 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 I'll literally chalk and cheese together. But chalk and cheese also talk to each other. Chalk and cheese also create a rift and a very interesting texture. So I think if the second thing that I would say is that my work is about creating texture, uh, texture which can't be articulated, which can't be, but it just, and, it, and the texture, interestingly, the, the, if you ask me what the texture is, if uh, it's always been kind of a scathing texture, it is scathing, um, um, uh, and it's scathing under under beauty, under ostensible beautiful things. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm stating the beautiful, but there is a scathing uh, texture underlying, which is kind of rendering the beauty the beauty beautiful um, and poignant. Because I think beauty without poignancy is maybe not beauty enough. As far as I'm concerned. So I'll quickly talk of, of some of my works and I'll go back to, um, I'm going to show you a clip of a work called Fana, Fana Ranja Revisited, which I made in 2024, uh, sorry, 24, uh, 2004. And it's a, it's a collaboration with uh, Madan Gopal Singh, um, who is a Sufi singer. So he brought in the Sufi component, the Punjabi Sufi component, and Ilangoman uh, Govindraj, who is a Karnataka folklist. So in this, um, it's a, and I'll tell you why I did this. So the 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 thing that prompted me to put Madan and uh, Ilangoman on the same stage, a Sufi singer, a Sufi Punjabi singer, a Karnatak vocalist, on the same stage, and my body in the middle of those two singers, was because I. Um, I was disturbed. I was hurt being a Sikh Bharatanatyam dancer. Um, it was it was really uh, demeaning. It was hurtful uh, to be somewhere recording this message that Carnatic music and Bharatanatyam were high art, and Punjabi music and dance and there's no dance. Punjabi music and um, singing is low art, um, as though. Culture is in Tamil Nadu and Bengal, but Punjab, as they said, has agriculture. So this was a this was a, a self derogatory joke, which many Punjabis of my generation would say, "Oh, Punjab is sort of agriculture, hai, culture to Bengal mein hai, things like that." And of course, I found that completely not just problematic, but bogus and uh, annoying um, and a lie. It was a downright constructed lie. Um, so I decided to test it out. I decided to put these two pieces of music together and then move to them, however. So I took um, uh, the uh, Punjabi's love legend of Hiranja, which I'm sure all of you know, and um, uh, a Kuruvanji from the Millad, uh, Kutral Kuruvanji. Uh, both of them are love stories and love stories across the world are the same. Um, there is attraction, there is some kind of an obstacle, um, and then, then there is either union or death, one of the two. And in this case, uh, so I put these two together and uh, um, uh, and I wasn't trying to create a fusion between the two. So I, I want this to be very clear. I'm not a fusion person at all. I, I dislike fusion, but I like the two being put together at the same level and then for people to see. And of course, when, 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 so when I was doing it, my own friends, my own partner, my very, very dear friends, they actually told me that they would not even come to watch the rehearsal because it was it was almost like sacrilege to put Punjabi with Carnatic music. So I, it was actually, I remember these, these three or four, three, four months, I worked completely in isolation. I had nobody to show it to. I had nobody to discuss it with. So I would go into my basement and Ilango would come. And when, very interestingly, I'll quickly say this, when the first few weeks of Ilangovan's group and a mother's group coming into the basement at a very large basement, they would both kind of, you know, skulk into the corners, into opposite corners, sit as far away from each other and have a very kind of, a, I mean, the attitude was on their skins. Um, they were uh, all, both of them were kind of smirking at each other um, and making like, um, um, not like comments um, and stuff like, stuff like that. And then within a few days, 
they started becoming friends. And after Fana happened, they started working together. And when we traveled um, on trains for the shows, um, the entire Karnataka ensemble would sit with us and sing um, Punjabi's uh, Punjabi um, uh, song, um, which which I think many of you would have heard. Madan's signature piece called uh, Rancha Jogi Da Bandaya. So I'm going to show this. And before I show this, I'll also say that before that, about about a good seven or eight years before that, I'd done another piece, uh, which I had uh, in which uh, Shubham Mudgal had sung, and in in that I had put two narratives, one. Uh, the Punjabi uh, story of Sasi Punno and the other of uh, um, uh, Kalidasa's Kumar Sambhavam. And the, 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 uh, the, the theme of both was, what I culled out from both was the mother's anxiety over her daughter's plight in love. Literally that. It was the mother's anxiety over the daughter's plight in love. On one hand, it is Uma's mother who is saying, what are you doing, you know, going up to this madman with ashes and snakes around him. And on the other hand, Sassi's mother is telling her, is, is ki yari chodo, tum and of course, Sassi dies and um, Uma becomes Bharati, whatever. So this was a combination between um, Punjabi and... Um, so this was my first experiment, so to speak, by putting two narratives together, which are talking of the same thing. And which... So the, when I talk of these things, it's like, and these are well, very well researched, of course. So that's where the archive comes in. These are very well researched, um, very well organized. Um, and what, and uh, another thing is that when I'm making, when as I, as a dancer, I'm looking or relying on archive, I am, I already have a comment to make. And the comment to make, of course, one is that, you know, this whole bogusness of high and low art, uh, the incongruity of it. But more than that, the, the, um, uh, the, the seamlessness in this discontinuity. It's actually, I call it seamless discontinuity. It is not continuous. I mean, jumping from Karnataka to Punjabi Sufi is not continuous. So it's discontinuous, but there is a seamless discontinuity uh, and there is the, and it is, it is dis, it's disconcerting. And the disconcerting is, is something that creates a texture. Um, and uh, 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 it kind of, um, it's kind of a rude awakening, so to speak. On one hand, of course, it's very, very fascinating and very, very seductive because it's beautiful. But on the other hand, it's like chalk and cheese. It's like you, um, there are some who would not want to still grasp it and yet cannot not grasp it or get drawn to it. So um, uh, without further ado, I think I'm eating up too much time. Let me show you the uh, Fana uh, uh, clip. Um, so if you can play the clip from Fana, please. Um, this, was a, this is a recent recording. I went back on stage a few months ago. Uh, I haven't danced for eight years or seven years um, uh, for various reasons. Um, but uh, my very dear friend Kamala Basim died and in her memory, she had asked me actually to dance because she loved this piece. So I did this piece and it's a, the recording from last December. Yes, can we see it, please? <laughs> जापे जो रब दा जुमाल वे मैं तो नहीं जाना खेड़ियां देना मैं नहीं जाना खेड़ियां देना ते ख्वाजा खिजरी दे बैठ के कसम खादी थी वा सूर जे प्रीत दी रीत तोड़ा Joy. 
ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂ ਦੋ ਜ਼ਖਾਂ ਦੇ ਤੇਰੇ ਬਾਜ ਜਗੰਤ ਮੈਂ ਹੋਰ ਲੋੜਾਂ ਕੰਨ ਪੜਵਾ ਕੇ ਮੱਥੇ ਦਿਲ ਕੋ ਲਗਾਇਆ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੋਗੀੜਾ ਬਣਾਇਆ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੋਗੀੜਾ ਬਣਾਇਆ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੋਗੀੜਾ ਬਣਾਇਆ ਰਾਜਾ ਜੋਗੀੜਾ so this was uh, um one kind of work um and i i um and i keep working i have kept working on similar work where i am using punjabi music and also bharatanatyam and carnatic in this particular clip we did not hear the carnatic because it was a very short trailer um but i have been doing uh, more and more of these two whenever i do, whenever i do bharatanatyam it's it always includes some punjabi element sometimes i even sing myself um uh, so that's one uh the second um over the last decade something that has emerged since 2010 is that i have made three pieces and very serious pieces as far as i'm concerned which all of them they deal with um the relationship between a servant and a malik or a, or a master um and so i have been kind of and this is something that i uh so something of course draws me to their condition to the um to the again the the incongruity of this inequality and also inequality in such proximity that within the same house within this very rich middle class house you see these rich mebsabs <laughs> dripping with diamonds and then we you see these very very poor people so these poor people get to see uh, prosperity from at such close quarters um that it is um it is almost vulgar that the proximity is vulgar and um and it must have done something enough for me that i made over the last 10 years i made three major pieces um the first one was uh, um which i'll show you a little bit clip of the first i'll just talk about all three and then show you uh, at least clips of one or two uh, the first is uh, actually um, based on it was made for the commonwealth uh, games it's, it's based on doris lessing's um, the gra- the, uh, the grass is singing uh, in which there's a there's an erotic encounter between a white woman and a black servant in south africa in apartheid south africa and it ends up being um so the tensions and um, violence and murder and all this stuff and in within that i had juxtaposed the the narratives that i had picked up just like you know you can't you can't miss these memes up talking about these people uh inko to bachcho ki tarah rakhte hain aur phir bhi dekho kaisa karte hain hamare sath and all that stuff. um and also i started to kind of talk to the servants and the maids um about um you know what what was what was it that they muttered under their breaths because um i could see that some of them were actually muttering but what were they muttering um and there was a uh, at that point i had very um i actually over this period i had decided but i could not i decided that i would go to tihar and talk to servants who had been incarcerated for um killing their uh, masters or mistresses um but i couldn't i somehow it didn't work out i just couldn't get go through go through the red tape but i did speak with many people about many servants about <clears throat> what they feel 
about the meme subs. Um, so, um, so what I'm going to show you show you is Doris Lessing, and what I, as a middle class North Indian, have heard over and over again um, in these encounters between the servants and their sahibs and name sahibs. It's a longer clip. You might not see the whole thing. So this one is called, um, um, it's not called Rasa Singing. Um, I was, I, I called it Rasa Singing and I got a copyright lawyer call me from Doris Lessing's office uh, or uh, uh, what do you call it? Estate. Uh, so I changed the name to Gray's also a color. Can we see it please?
Yeah, I think we can stop here. And uh, I'll, I'll go straight into the next. So the next two uh, pieces that I made on similar themes was one was called Charumati Claire Singh. And the story goes that it had Charumati, <clears throat> who is um, um, actually uh, was a Devadasi. And there's a, there's a song with Charumati's name in it. Um, and there's a Padam or a Javali. Um, Claire is, so I, I was, uh, I have been uh, a great fan of Jean Genet and I've always wanted to work with uh, his play called The Maids. So I juxtaposed The Maids and the narrative of the Devadasis. So Dasis and Maids. Um, so uh, The Maids, of course, was the script, um, which was adapted. Um, of course, I used it non-verbally. Uh, and on the other hand, there was these collected narratives or conjected narratives of the Devadasi's lives. Um, and so it was Charumati was Charumati, the Devadasi. Claire is one of the maids, Claire and Solange. And Singh is I. So I'm the Singh. So it is my story. Um, it is about Charumati. And it is, so it's like three registers um, of, uh, of um, and each of us identifying with the other. Um, the maid. Um, Claire, and of course, if you know mates, there is uh, there is violence in that as well. Um, there is Charmati, and there is Navdeep Singh. So, uh, and this and this uh, was uh, commissioned by the IFA indeed. This was in twenty thirteen, I think. And dance.
Yes. So um, this uh, brings me to my. Uh, so there was another piece. There was a sequel to uh, this, which was called Frenemies, which was also uh, it was a duet, um, which also included the maids and uh, the padam, <clears throat> the, the the voice or the amorous song of the devdas. Um, about a couple of years ago in 2018, I made a piece uh, which was called Tanasha. Um, it's a piece that I'm still performing. I've, uh, I'm going to perform again very soon after the lockdown now. I haven't done it in more than two and a half, three years. Um, it's, uh, it's based on the <clears throat> jail diaries of Bhagat Singh. So it's about um, the idea of freedom and how, of course, these narratives get appropriated um, or twisted. And into this narrative, I have woven my own story of a Sikh boy becoming a Bharatanatyam dancer. Um, so there are these two. And again, uh, my love for Karnatak music and um, Bhagat Singh's love for uh, Heer, the rendering of Heer, <clears throat> uh, which is a genre of singing. Um, so I, I combined those two and yeah, so the, the two narratives are <clears throat> very well documented, uh, letters and, um, of course the, the essay and other, other letters of Bhagat Singh, which put little other, um, bits and pieces into the piece and, um, my own story and different kinds of music. Um, so this is, um, Tanasha. And this was done for the Serendipity Festival in 2018 in Goa. I'm sorry about the quality of recordings. It's not very good, but uh, this is the best we can have. So I'll just show, I'm just showing a little clip of this, not a whole trailer. <laughs> You know, when I was uh, researching this piece, I learned that Bhagat Singh used to sing here while in prison. So in the cell he would belt out here. Apparently he sang very beautifully. And incidentally, Udham Singh, when he's imprisoned in England after having assassinated General Dyer to avenge General Malapa, Uttam Singh calls for a copy of Baris Shah's Heed he, to be sent to him in prison. And he calls for this book of poetry, not to read and recall the poetry of his faraway land, but to, but to take oath on it in court. So Heed, Ek Punjabi Ismeer, 
ਜਿਸ ਦੇ ਉੱਪਰ ਮਤਲਬ ਇੱਕ ਇਸ਼ਕ ਦੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਦੇ ਉੱਪਰ ਹੱਥ ਰੱਖ ਕੇ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਖਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਾਮ ਅਪਰਚੀ ਐਂ ਬੀਸ ਬੀ ਦ ਬ੍ਰਾਂਚਸ ਬ੍ਰਿਕਸ਼ੇ
um, I think that this we can, and I'm very sorry about the quality of this. I didn't realize I, that this was of such poor quality. And I just received it from one of my editors. Um, apologize for that. So we can now, I guess, open the house for questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Navdeet. We can, I think we can be put in the gallery mode now, right? Yeah, so we are all here. Uh, thank you so much. That was a fascinating presentation and actually to listen to an artist how um, and like a true artist who also critique the idea of the archive, our received sense of what the archive is and uh, pull it in directions where we can also talk about and discuss what the archive can become with uh, the interference of the artist, if I may use that within quotes. They've been very interesting questions. So let's go straight to it so that, um, Vishadeep, so let me take the first one and then maybe you'll sure. take the next one, yeah? Sure, so The sure. first one, uh, Navdej, is from Lakshmi Subramaniam. And this is what she says. Mesmerizing performance and fascinating meditations on the archive, especially the arts archive, that by default is about process. My question is that for a discipline like, say, history, the archive and the idea of the archive has undergone rapid changes from being a depository to a process while retaining the idea of singularity and publicness as an index of archival reason. With an arts archive, what determines the logic of archival reason or of aesthetic validation? In other words, what happens with an institutional arts archive? And there's an, another comment on the matter, on the master-servant relationship, intimate violence, if you will, I was fascinated by the work you do, especially when I juxtapose, juxtapose it with literary and even legal archives on the same. Fascinating how theoretical concepts tumble out uh, in your practice. Beautiful. So that's that's a whole lot of Okay, that's that's a whole geez. I won't remember. Um, and I don't even, you know, I'm very bad. I have, I have like memory lapses. So uh, Lakshmi, thank you. Um, but I think uh, I don't remember all the questions, but maybe uh, you can prompt me. Yeah. Yeah. But let me talk about the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the archive. I know that the, in history, the archive has gone through like, you know, this whole debate about archive and memory and all this stuff it's going through. And, 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 and um, it's, it's a very valid uh, debate. Um, um, but how do we, um, how do we make, how, do, how does art make the archive its own? I think that's my concern. How do, because I don't want to kind of fight, fall into the tropes that history has already created for us, or even the divisions that it's creating. Um, because, so if I, if I, if I ask myself as a young artist, or as a, what was I looking for? The first thing that I wanted was uh, permission to follow my hunch. I have, a, as an artist, we have a hunch and I can't, I can't kind of, it doesn't let me sleep, but I can't somehow substantiate it. I can't kind of articulate it. So there is this, of course, I need information and I need a language and I need a process, I need a, a technique. All those things are something that I learn in an art school or in seminars or an apprenticeship or through practice. That's a different thing. But what can an artist, what can I derive out of an archive? Um, of course, I out of an archive, I can derive um, a whole collage of information, first of all, pertaining to a piece of art. Um, so a project, a whole collage, um, uh, and which, and again, when I say the collage, I would like the collage to go beyond the project into the historical time that it's coming out of. I think that's very important. The historical time that is the context it's emerging out of, uh, we need to place it because that's the connection. I mean, art's connection is with its time. So I think that connection um, is something, but uh, so these are, these are things that how does an artist of, you know, the last generation or someone like even like last year, how did they negotiate the times they live in, um, the, the, the comments that they wish to make uh, or the interventions they wish to make? And uh, what, were, what, were, what were the um, inner dialogues uh, that they went through? Um, and of course the processes, but, uh, but if, if I can, if I can, if I can get, you know, um, uh, be privy to the in internal dialogues that an artist goes through in how he or she negotiates and finds a voice 
um, finds a voice to something that is unspeakable, so un unvoiceable, not speakable, unvoiceable uh, or unexpressible. How do they, uh, because at, apart from skill and talent and ability and everything, it also requires a license. It also requires permission. And I think the archive particularly can be geared to somehow package permission for me. Give me permission because processes is not something that I can learn. I can, I can, okay, it's very interesting for me to, you know, because I can go to school and learn processes and techniques and learn about them. But I want, uh, I want, I want something that builds my confidence in, in being, um, in being um, uh, an outsider, so to speak, or being um, alone in my journey. So I think, I think, and like if I envision what an archive can be, I don't know if I'm asked, answering your question, uh, Lakshmi, but this is, I'm, I'm like intervening, I'm putting my own uh, thing that an, an arts archive can um, somehow help me with that. Um, so it's, it's, that means it is not only talking about fact, facts and factual uh, events uh, and factual stuff that can be documented uh, and can be made public, that's one thing, but also stuff that is, uh, ostensibly private, um, um, so journals, journal entries, um, asides, um, stuff like that, the internal dialogues, the things that are, um, so that we can get closer. I mean, things, as we, I think we've spoken about this earlier, things that without, uh, that, that, that don't have, so to speak, closure, things that don't have resolve, even that, those tidbits of information, which don't, which can't be packaged, so to speak. So even unpackaged stuff, unfinished stuff, unclosed stuff, stuff that has not found closure, um, which is not conclusive, I think a place for a whole new space, because that space is the breathing space. That is, that is the space that actually breathes, that has not been closed off, because other stuff becomes like dead information. Finish. But this is, this is live because these are unconclusive <clears throat> things. And only practice and process will um, will yield some result or res yield some closure. <clears throat> but so I think this is for me the um, what an archive and art archive offer me um, a whole repository, a whole um, a treasure of um, tidbits which are without closure mm. and also an inner dialogue, so that I. I can I can be a little I can gain a little more permission um, to be um, to be the odd one out that I am feeling at that point probably. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, Lakshmi, but this is what I feel. Uh, Arundhati, have I answered the question to some degree? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, the that's the archival reason you sort of um, constructed the what you think is the logic of the arch archival reason. The art archive, an, yeah. Uh, for an arts archive. Yeah. Um, Bishati, we want to take the next one. Yeah. First, uh, thank you, Navtej, for enriching us with such a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. And uh, I'll just read a question from. Bishati? On the. Yes. You got a little stuck, I think, for a second. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Shantanu Maji uh, has a question. He uh, said that, uh, dear Navtej, your initial musings on the literal meaning of the word archive made me realize that archivists are not only the guardians of the documents that they safeguard, but at times they also have the power to interpret the archives. On that note, would you suggest an archivist to keep aside individual preferences while working on an archive? Um. Yeah, I, it's very difficult. It's very like, you know, I mean, even, okay, one thing is to have intervention. I mean, one thing is to have comment, um, uh, to make judgment or to uh, to somehow, somehow pronounce comment on what the content is. That is one thing. And that can be withheld somehow. But the aesthetic of its arrangement, because it's arranged, it's the arrangement, it's the curating of the archive. Literally, like every it's like literally a curation, and the curation would have a would have a would have would have some organization, and I would say maybe even some aesthetic, which has to be subjective. I mean, you cannot take the archivist out of the arrangement 
or the sequence uh, sequencing or the aesthetics of of things putting together so i'm i'm afraid that the archivist will put two and two and two together in his or her own way and then it is for the archive visitor to decide that he doesn't have to receive it in that same order of two and two and two he might uh, but i think it's i mean i personally feel that um it would be um it would be deluding ourselves if we say that this is a very objective a very neutral thing and we are by doing that we're falling into the into the old trope again of being ob ob objectivity mm -hmm. so i think let's not even go there uh, because it cannot be objective um i will color it i will i cannot help coloring it i'm human and i love coloring things i cannot not color things mai usko is tarah sajaunga ki wo to usme mera rang chadega um but but maybe you know somehow how do how do how do we make the archive available in a way that everybody who comes in is allowed that that's the permission to color it and order it and sequence it in the own way maybe it can be a hands on archive that, that they are like have a room where you are like you know every week you have one artists work together and ask them to arrange it like they want it like everybody ask them to come visit the archive and rearrange it ki unko kis unko ye kis how does this material speak to them i think that i mean i'm just thinking on my feet right now but that's one way because it's the arrangement and there's an aesthetic in the arrangement and there's a uh, there's a message in the arrangement mm. you see which you cannot withhold you cannot um and you can't say that this is a neutral arrangement because neutral arrangements are of course boring and neutral arrangements are not neutral <laughs> yeah now think just to add to this you know specifically talking about the ifa archive and vishudeep pranav um anushka the archive team knows it very well at ifa there are two layers of archives right one is because all the work and the copyright belong to the artists and scholars and they tell us what we can put up in the archive a they have the choice to send us the material they want so they are anyway doing a first set of archiving deciding this has to be remembered and this does not have to be remembered or i will not give this to a public archive to remember this is mine or whatever so that yeah, is i'm sorry that. this is this is what the artist is doing or the or the pre archive i mean no the artist is doing This is for uh, the artist at the end. Of uh, the I think project. I think this is yeah. this is again. I'm um, this is. Um, I'm, let me just stop you here for a yeah. second because this is interesting. Yeah. Um, that the artists are also kind of preserving preserving their dignity, so to speak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or literally. How much they want to reveal of that. Absolutely. Artists. How much they want to reveal and how much they want to be known. Um, um, because uh, nobody wants. I mean, because we live in a world of order, hmm. we we are we are not comfortable with disclosing disorder. Yeah. कि अच्छा ये ऐसे भी सोचता है इतना confused है बंदा. Huh? but the thing is that that's the that's the so i think this is this is like this is this is a kind of a reconditioning maybe the archive can have workshops with artists yes. of deconditioning that un un unfinished stuff is finished like every like literally when i when i teach dance like an incomplete moment is complete moment in itself it's a choice it's a decision so you don't have to the whole thing of completion and closure and order so um so i think this is something that the artists have to be yeah. allowed yeah. also be, hmm. yeah but it's interesting that they just say that because most many artists like to dig into what they call resources for their work where they actually pick up material from disorder whether it is a factory in demolition stage absolutely. or it is absolutely. a person's life being completely swept away by something the artist goes in there to pick up ingredients materials which yeah. is in disorder but yeah. when the artist presents now what you said their material they don't see it as being resources for someone else right it's finished then it is a finished product they want to hmm. yeah but yeah but maybe we have to discuss with some artists like yourself how can these workshops be uh yeah. freeing for the artist to think yeah. yeah i think we have to kind of somehow uh, somehow allow disorder um allow literally it's an it's an allowance see this is yeah. this is valid enough it doesn't have to be taped up um because again it's the, it's, the, it's the dignity ki i can't be seen to be messy yeah literally i can't be seen to be messy i i want to be seen i want to be remembered as having been in control yeah this is this is like the underlying underlying um kind of voice mm. of of all of us and that this is how we preserve our dignity ki banda bada you know 
in control tha his life was manageable and we god knows that our lives are so unmanageable as artists yeah um, uh, and uh, and that's the that's the fodder of art hmm. yeah it is but but never then that that art is never seen as the fodder for someone else right I, mean, I think they have to they have to see it so that's why you know this whole idea of the legacy like if you are seeing yourself as a legacy then i think um i think maybe i have his next job is to kind of to initiate such artists yeah. like initiate artists into such kind of a deconditioning yeah i don't know okay. how that works yeah I'll, I'll, there are lots of questions so i'll also move on to the next one the next one is interesting from john xavier's uh, john from from ifa uh, he is asking just once this is gone yeah fascinating talk and reflections on the role of the archives in practice could you kindly elaborate on the negotiations that you had to do with the doris lessing estate please and he's asking this as a way of trying to understand the different kinds of negotiations artists have to do when they are using work of other people which other people own copyrights to and we face that often in our in our kind of work right. as well as supporters of arts where right. people come and say you know i want to use this but i can't what do i do and where is that negotiation mm -hmm. going to happen yeah um yeah this this came to me as a root shock because i thought you know that this work was because i calculated when it was written it was beyond 50 years or whatever it yeah, was yeah. so i thought okay, i'm safe um and uh, and the thing is that earlier like even 20 years earlier i would without flinching use a piece of music and um, just of course give it credit that it's this one but that was it i didn't have to take permissions um, the way we have to take permissions now um so i'm i'm used to kind of you know using people's work but giving them credit without taking permissions um so i was spoiled i'm, I'm from that era um so with with the, with the estate it was very interesting it was like i performed it um in in delhi in delhi huh? in a small little megdo theater for sangeet nagar academy and within a week i'm not kidding within a week i get up from london saying that you have uh, you have violated this um, uh, thing and Um, 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 so there'll be, um, um, I, I forget what it was, uh, um, um, it, it either said that I had to pay up or, I mean, there, there, would, there, there would be consequences. I was told that there would be consequences. So I quickly went and changed the name. Yeah. I consulted with somebody, like a lawyer, and they said that we changed the name. And it just said this is based upon a novel by Rajesh Lessing. um it might be already so i said it's it's loosely based and of course you can easily justify that it's loosely based because there's hardly any script in it yeah um uh, so that's what i did um so i quietly kind of you know slipped out the the patli gali as they say um <laughs> uh, and i i i just i i i must have responded to them um but um but i didn't carry this forward by right uh, okay. so it was never it never came on on uh, on social media so to speak as the grass is singing it always came as grey as a feather also again going back to the ifa archive as as and also to tell our um, listeners today that all the material that you see in the ifa archive actually belongs to the artists and scholars who have made right, them, right? it's their projects yeah. they are just yeah. supporters and and therefore this is like a catalog archive where you can see the material but if you have to use it in any way you need their permission so there's a whole process by which you get their permission then you come to us and then we allow for use it so that's also it'll be interesting if people go and take a look at the ifa archive and and see um you know what kind of material is there and uh, so we should yeah. want to move to yeah. the next question so uh, i'll quickly move to the next question so uh, we have a question from sanjukta wag uh, she asked that i think one of your most uh, resonant archives for me has been your barps practice and training Uh, it's an archives uh, keywords that are imbued with, uh, uh, imbued with uh, multiple layers of somatic wisdoms gathered over years something we get to experience unfold every week as students and fellow practitioners please do share something about how this living archive emerged and developed or in short would you comment about your method of body as archive well wow, that's a good question but uh, let me see how i can answer it i'm going to go somewhere else for that um so baps uh, is uh, something that it's a, it's a body practice and body practice that I've devised it's called baps um and it's it's actually um baps is uh, an acronym for bracing so it's a, it's, a, it's basically a yoga practice bracing alignment rotation poise and spacious stretch and then of course out of these five words about 
30 other words have spawned out of them and uh, so um, so it's it's it goes back to it goes back to uh, the same thing that i was talking about the uh, that that is that 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 uh, that uh, defies speech there are so many things that defy speech um, which pertain to the body the body feels but the body can't so what i experience my experience definitely exceeds my speech that is you know that's that's the fundamental truth uh, that uh, speech is so to speak limited and speech is gross so to speak in comparison to what the body feels and senses and can even betray through its movement through its stance through its pitch through its coloring kya kya um so um so to answer sanjukta's question um uh, my the reason that i wanted to kind of you know begin to inform this with keywords as opposed to ideas so it was it's so first of all it's a replacement of ideas by keywords so ideas like what have become popularly ideas uh, associated with the yoga of surrender and purity and um, perfection and i mean all these words are loaded and you know, to me are antithetical to yoga not only wrong and problematic they are antithetical so i kind of uh, uh, in a way the words that i started coming up with and the words now that we have are availability buoyancy um uh, permission permission is the word that i worked on this morning i think poise um um a suggestion spaciousness so these are these are all evocative words and when when they are presented in a in a in a sensorial manner they actually i feel and i think sanjukta would vouch for that they they kind of they 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 talk to the ambiance of the body to me the body has an ambiance and it's the ambiance and i'm 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 actually trying to tap not the organs of the body or the clinical body but the ambiatic um, the yeah the amp, the ambiance of the body um because that's the sensory that sensory that's resonant resonance comes out of the ambiance uh, when i look at a piece of object so this is something with arcus when i look at a piece of object as a aesthetic object i'm not just looking at it as an object but i am looking at it as i'm looking at the object with its ambiance and even though the object itself will evoke a word in my head which is the the meaning which with which i define it if i look at it aesthetically it will it will it will um it will evoke resonance i will there will be resonance because i'm looking at it not as an object but an object with its with its ambiance mm-hmm. and so it's like one ambiance resonating with the other and that's that's the beauty of art and body particularly body for me so um so this is how it came about uh, uh, sanjukta and um, it began with five words and when it started i was like i had no idea what i was doing and then as we and it's also building up a confidence the more confidence the more i more i see it really working in front of my eyes um these words just keep popping into my head like agencies another word that you use um so um because um yeah i think i look at a body and the word comes to me because i because i either see that body becoming disposed to that word or struggling with that word mm. uh, or struggling with permission and i see people struggling with permission which is which is like the commonest thing um sab kuch kar lenge but permit nahi karenge um so the word permission came and mm. so like when when you when permission becomes like a like a stated articulated word and that and that so so this morning i was teaching class on permission and saying that at one level it requires a decision i have to decide to permit myself it's a decision it's not something that i get inspired to permit myself it's a decision it's a, a so um, so it is something that i have to stand on my feet think on my own two feet think for myself by myself on myself and then permit because otherwise permission is not going to happen so this is how it happens um and i would say yes it's an archive these words are uh, are like an archive of the body because they're preserving the body and uh, they're preserving the ambiance of the body they are preserving the ambiance by, of the body by allowing um um to evoke the ambiance and that's the only way i can preserve it yeah thank yeah. you beautiful books thank you thanks uh, navdeep the next uh, question is also from another uh, dancer bangalo anuradha venkatraman and uh, she says i wish i could see the devdasi and maids as a live performance i'm curious do you document your thought process of choreography 
that can later become a part of archives for people to read and go into a journey with the artist. Mm. I, I guess she's asking, is there a, some kind of journal keeping or? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a journal junkie. Um, or I used to be a general junkie. I think now with age, I'm less of a general junkie, but there was earlier, I could not, I mean, that was my, my that was my mode to sanity, actually. Like, actually, growing up gay, that was my mode to sanity, was just journaling every little thought, every little sensation, every little doubt, every little flicker um, that I had. Um, that was the only way I could, you know, create space for myself. Um, so yes, I think journaling is a, um, but if you ask my, if you ask me, um, that whether I, um, uh, write journals while I'm making work, yes, I do. Um, but I think what I struggle with personally is the organization of it, because uh, th this is why I need a personal archivist. I hate looking back at work. It makes me squirm. Um, it makes me the most difficult thing is to kind of go back and look at my work and review it clinically um, and to look at a video. It's it's that's the difficult part for me. Um, I can mull over it, think over it. Um, but um, yeah, so it is um, it is something that is something that I when I'm making the work, definitely. But then um, once that work is out of my system, I, I don't like to dwell on it, even though the next work comes out of it. So that's also interesting. Like I said, three works came out of one another uh, over the last. Um, I would say every work comes out of the one before. Actually, there is something. Nandesh, do you share that online? Just asking because she she talked about this this journaling and this thought process being documented, being shared for other people to take a journey with. So, like on your website, you you have a little concept. I'm also asking this as a provocation because you said like how in the IFA archive people don't want to put up. Uh, you know, uh, things that are, not, are in a little bit of chaos and disarray. Uh, but would, would you like to share it at some point or? You know, I mean, I, I also thought of it just now, uh, frankly. Uh, I didn't think of it earlier. And it's, uh, an, it's an appealing thought for me. Yeah. Um, I think, yes. So maybe, maybe I would maybe make a virtual room of um, thoughts, objects, um, writings, movements, phrases, songs. Um, that all um, evoke. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we should yeah. we'll take the next yeah. one. We have a couple of more. Is that yeah. time wise enough, Tej, with you? Maybe one more. It's we already at okay. eight o'clock. Okay. 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 Yeah. So if that's uh, all right. the next. Okay. Right. So the next question is from uh, Saran uh, Sugan from Facebook. Uh, is there a way in which this archive and process could become relevant in our current times in a different way, considering the manner in which histories are being rewritten and repackaged and also consumed in entirely new ways. Oh. Um. Hmm. You know, in one way I feel, I and mean, I could be completely wrong. So historians, please forgive me. I feel, um, that we have landed where we have landed um, in some way because we have been, because I feel an archive, an, a conventional archive can be very dogmatic. Like, like uh, uh, objectivity, the idea of objectivity, ob objectivity is dogmatic. So only relying on, you know, documented facts as though that is the only fact and anything else that happened or went behind it is not, not to be factored, so to speak. Um, so I think this this dogma is um, is what has maybe landed up where we are, um, that we have dishonored either other histories or, um, um, as some would say, other memories. Um, uh, just because the dogma cannot cannot accommodate them, cannot tolerate them, and the and the dogma is very very judgmental. It's, it, there's a tyranny to the dogma. I mean, objectivity is very tyrannical, yeah. uh, and everything that comes out of it is there. There's a tyranny, and there's a there's a I mean, there's a whole colonial thing out there, you know, of of shaming and berating and belittling and demeaning. Um, so, given the story today, I think I don't actually I've I've forgotten even what 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 you're asking me. I got so carried away, but I think um, whatever is happening uh, needs to be very well documented. 
that's that's the only thing even even the shifts that are happening so even 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 document the comparisons uh, between what was and what has become um, so these are otherwise if this link is broken then we are in trouble so the we have to kind of uh, we have to document um and document in a in a um i would say despite our own personal feelings and positions in a sensitive manner in a sympathetic manner um, um uh, uh, yeah but we cannot i mean if there is a shift in, you know see i mean these shifts happen and when if these shifts go unnoticed then the narrative is intact the new narrative is intact but to make the new narrative um questionable because it is an unsound narrative and i'm afraid most of the narratives that you and i have bought into are also very unsound <laughs> you know so let's not say that we are of sound narrative and um, so uh, and the thing is that it has become sound because the the shifts that took place uh, historically culturally politically have been erased and that's part of the shifting I and mean, that's the that's the that's the uh, the shifting of project you spoke bitai do so i think they have to be the shifts have to be very well documented and very well organized so it's like double time work mm. um yeah so that's what i would i don't know if i answered your question but this is what i mean now this is only actually one question na, bolo na, bolo, bolo. so this is from barbara malavo ियाली maybe because i feel there's so much organization to be done inside my creation processes at the same time that they are chaotic in nature so if you uh, think there are some interesting relations would be great to hear a little more okay i'll be very brief barbara this is going to be a longer conversation and when she's talking of sangraha and karika she's we are talking about something from the natya shastra um where um it's like um, sangraha is actually organization like sangrahale you know the the museum or the or the inventorizing or the organization of of things objects thoughts bhavas all these things like how do we organize them um so uh, and so it's literally this is like a you know a 1500 old text which is talking of this inventorizing and captioning so they have to be even if it's a, even if it's something that's the internal thing um as a dancer i have to caption it to be able to recall it at will caption it organize it store it um in in a fashion so um so this is what she's talking about and um so that is why you know this is all about uh, i mean inspiration is one thing uh, talent is one thing uh organization also plays a huge huge <coughs> huge role how do i organize my skills how do i organize my um like as a dancer how do i organize the different feelings in my body uh when i mean if i if they are disorganized if they are cluttered i will i will miss the cue i will not be able to recall them on cue so to speak but if they are well polished and well articulated and well captioned then i know exactly where to look and how to look to to i, I don't know if this makes sense of how to evoke or how to trigger a certain sensation in my body or certain feeling in my body and it's it's actually creating an i used to say this earlier like creating an auxiliary memory it's like a parallel memory i create within the body in which i category like i i i organize feelings um to be called at will and not just feelings but shades of feelings combinations of feelings um and and caption them with and what is the caption in this case i caption them with a gesture that this gesture would signify the downpour of this feeling this stance would capture this feeling so when i go into this stance and look at if i tilt my head like that something will be released in my body so i caption it with gestures with stances with shapes but this um, so um, so literally caption is like a button how do i press this button so that it you know sim sim khul ja it opens um so um, so organization is super important and of course you at the archive know this more than anybody else um that um and that's a that's a 
that's a whole different ball game. And as an artist, I am bad at that. Like I'm okay here, but when it comes to actual documents and videos and tapes, and it's like it's too much paraphernalia. Um, so I mean, that's my disclosure. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you so much Dan, yeah. for yeah. doing this. Lovely. Talk. Thank you for inviting me. This has been this has been wonderful for me too. I, uh, yeah, I it made me think. I just listen to you and see the work because we we've, we've seen some of us have seen the work without you having you know sort of talked about it. So it was quite amazing for us. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I'll invite Vishudeep to um, do the thanks and. Uh, I thank you, Navtej, for engaging us so thoroughly and sharing such a wonderful presentation with us and making this evening a special one. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience. The audience has also made this session fulfilling with their interesting questions. So I'd like to thank everyone who participated both on Zoom and on our Facebook Live. Uh, the IFA archive will be back soon with similar evenings. But before that, do join us for our next project showcase where the projects supported by IFA are presented by the project coordinators. The next project showcase is titled City Dialogues and Encounter with the Everyday uh, by Bhavin Shukla and Shojit Sarkar Sharka. So also join us on Thursday, March 31st at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, everyone. And uh, just you. a final, final note of thanks to the Indorama Charitable Trust. We need supporters to support archives, to make new archives. And I feel on behalf of all our grantees and project coordinators, trustees and staff would like to thank Indorama Charitable Foundation for uh, trusting us from day one and continuing to do so over the last uh, six years or so. Thank you. Good thank night. you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.